Hey everyone, welcome to Idealism Forever, where we do the thinking so the materialists don't have to. Yeah, it's not like they did a whole lot of that anyway, but yeah, so welcome to the show. I'm going to briefly introduce to you what the show is, and then we're going to dive right into the content. This will be quick. So this is just a very broad format live stream where I'll just do all kinds of things. I'll react to all kinds of videos, usually relating, relating to idealism but generally philosophy and other things like that. But um, I may also react to some articles or perhaps some tweets or other kinds of posts that people make. I'll have guests on from time to time. Um, I may have uh, somebody else host an episode as well. So um, yeah, it's, it's just kind of an informal sort of a thing. I'll joke around like I did at the beginning. I'll make you know light banter where I just poke fun, but it's all just for fun. But anyway, I guess with that out of the way, welcome to the show. And I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to share my screen here because we're going to be reacting to a debate that was had between Sean Carroll and Philip Goff. And if you don't know them, uh, Sean Carroll is a physicist, I believe at Johns Hopkins uh, University, which is a leading university. And Philip Goff is a leading panpsychist philosopher who is at, um, oh goodness, at Edinburgh, University of Edinburgh, I believe. Could be forgetting. But yeah, they're both interesting. Check them out. But anyway, Philip Goff is going to be arguing that consciousness is fundamental. And Sean Carroll's going to have problems with that. And the thing is, is that I have uh, objections to both of them when it comes to things that they have to say. So um, I don't know. Uh, there's going to be, uh, you know, who's going to really come out on top here? I don't know. But I think the idealist in general is going to have some takes here that I don't think either of them are really anticipating. So let's go ahead and go to the first timestamp here, where Philip Goff is just going to go ahead and kind of spell out what he's calling the mind-body problem. Okay, so what is the mind-body problem here for Goff? I chose Wix for my business because of its oh, no. massive scope for functionality oh, no, and freedom of creation. They got us with the ads. Bang up against the ancient conundrum the philosophers call the mind-body problem, which is quite simply the challenge of how, in very general terms, to do this, how to bring together what we know about reality from science, let's call that the physical world, with, what we, with, with the privately known reality of our own feelings and experiences. Let's call that consciousness. How, how to bring these two seemingly very different things, consciousness and the physical world, together in a single unified theory of reality. That's the challenge. So the mind-body problem. So rough, roughly speaking, there are three solutions. Okay, so he lists here three solutions. And he does at one point, to be fair, he does say that there are more than just these three solutions. But I'm noticing that he leaves out idealism. And idealism is a classic traditional answer to this. But, you know, and that bothers me, I don't really like that. But the thing is also at the same time, it's almost like idealism is there. He just sort of rebranded it as panpsychism. So look at his, let's look at his definitions real quick. Physicalism, the physical world is fundamental and consciousness emerges from physical processes in the brain. Okay, we would call that physicalism. Okay, now look at his definition of panpsychism. Certain facts about consciousness are fundamental, and the physical world emerges from those underlying consciousness facts. Now see, to me, that doesn't really sound like panpsychism. That sounds to me like idealism. Think about it. If I said that, well, the physical world is fundamental and that consciousness comes out of the physical world, you would call that a form of physicalism. So how is it not a form of idealism if we say, well, what's fundamental is consciousness and that the physical world comes out of that? It just sounds like they're just mirrors of the same uh, things there. So I think an important point to bring up is that, well, then what is panpsychism? And so I think to better answer that, 
maybe I'll just share this here for you guys so you can see better. So let's go ahead and just share this. So if you go to the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy, and this entry is written by a panpsychist named David Skirbina, who I've had on my uh, show before. I've had him on my channel. Um, he writes, panpsychism is the view that all things have a mind or a mind-like quality. And if you even look at the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, it says, panpsychism is the view that, mentali that mentality is fundamental and ubiquitous in the natural world. These definitions look very different than the definition that Philip gave in this debate. So to be more precise here, let me, let me scroll down a little bit here because David Skrubina does get into a little bit more detail here. Let's try this here. And I've quoted this before, but it's worth repeating because this issue keeps coming up. David Skrubina writes, who is a panpsychist, he says, panpsychism in itself is not a theory of mind per se, because it does not in general give an account of the precise nature of mind, nor of how it relates to material things. Rather, it is a meta theory. It is a theory about theories, a framework which says, however mind is to be conceived, it applies in some sense to all things. Thus, Panpsychism can apply in principle to virtually any conventional theory of mind. So what this means is that panpsychism per se isn't actually something different from physicalism, at least inherently. It's possible to have a version of physicalism that is also panpsychist in its nature. If you follow the definitions we brought up before, if you say consciousness is a physical thing, but it's fundamental and ubiquitous, just like what Galen Strawson says, well, then that's a form of physicalism and panpsychism. So panpsychism isn't actually, when defined properly, it's not an alternative to physicalism. And what's ironic is that Philip makes a similar point in a different context. So I'm going to go to this other timestamp here. He's talking about something else when he makes this point. But the same point he's making here applies to himself. So let's check this out. After we get destroyed by another ad, of course. See? Oh, no. Um, wait a second. Hold on one second here. wanted to make sure of something here because <laughs> it didn't look like it was showing you guys what was going on there there we go okay sorry for that little technical error so yeah we're basically right where we need to be let's see what he's got to say there are strong there are forms of it which clash with current physics and forms of it which don't so this is just an irrelevant question to which is the better theory panpsychism or physicalism right so so i the answer to the question is you know, there are forms of both, just like there are forms of, you know, you could ask the same date question to the physicalist, right? Um, so I don't think this is, the, this is the way to distinguish them. Oh, yeah, I mean, this... Yes, exactly. So that same point that he's saying in a different context, I'm saying in this context that this isn't the right way to distinguish panpsychism and physicalism. They aren't actually distinct. Here are your main options for now, okay? Here are the three. You got idealism, You've got materialism and then dualism. And if you want, no matter which one of those you choose, if you want to, you can add panpsychism to that if you think it'll help for, or for whatever reason, but you don't have to. It's a meta theory. It's compatible with physicalism, dualism, and idealism. It's not an alternative like that. So this is a misunderstanding. And this is inadvertently uh, erasing idealism because he's confusing um, idealism and panpsychism here. And so I think what Philip wants to defend really at the end of the day, as I will explain in more detail, 
is idealism because he does want an alternative to physicalism and dualism. But the problem is panpsychism doesn't deliver that. So we're going to go ahead and skip to this other section here where he's going to give this criterion of simplicity. So let's see what he's got to say here. Okay, so if we can't distinguish between them with an experiment, how do we decide which is correct? Good question. Here's the answer. I propose we apply the following two criteria. One, simplicity. As philosophers and scientists, we, we don't just go for any old theory that accounts for the data. We try to go for the simplest theory, or maybe the most elegant, unified, parsimonious. So that's one criteria. Secondly, explanatory success. Does the theory meet its explanatory obligations? For example, physicalism, I would say, is obliged to explain consciousness in the terms of physical science, whilst panpsychism is obliged to explain the physical world in terms of consciousness, right? So how well do they do on those explanatory obligations? Okay, there's the methodology, there's the criteria. Let's apply it. So firstly, in terms of simplicity, I think this gives the edge to... Okay, so notice how, and I brought up this point here, because this will come up mainly later on, but to make this more clear, idealism is the main options here. He says, well, the monistic options, okay, are physicalism, and he wants to say panpsychism, but that's not true, because it's possible to have dualism that's also panpsychist. And actually, a lot of versions of, of panpsychism are like that. Philip Goff used to say a while back that, well, what's fundamental are these fundamental, these physical particles and stuff like that, the, the smallest bits of matter. And what, what happens is you have the physical properties and that physical entity, but in addition to that, you have these irreducible mental properties sort of attached to those physical entities. That is still a form of panpsychism but it's dualistic. You have both physical and mental properties. And those like uh, Ralph Stefan Weir argue that that actually lapses into full-blown substance dualism, but that's getting ahead of ourselves a bit. The point is panpsychism and dualism are not inherently different. Pan panpsychism is not a monistic option. So it's not, it doesn't fit in the simplicity criterion that he's meeting, which we're trying to bring up here. So Really, it's physicalism and idealism that he's trying to talk about. And again, like I said, if you want to accept either of those, okay. And if you want to, you can tag on panpsychism to those, but you don't have to as well. It's just a meta theory. So we're going to go ahead and jump ahead because I think I've explained that point there. So this right here. Most people oh have no goodness. clue that These in 2023, the best way to make money on Amazon brutal. is not with physical. In terms of its central explanatory task, how do we account for the physical reality in terms of consciousness? We have all Okay, yeah, well, first off, yeah, right there, I want to start right there. He's trying to say to account physical reality in terms of consciousness. If you really think that through, I mean, you don't even have to think about it on its face. That just sounds like idealism, and that is idealism. If I told you we're going to explain consciousness in physical terms, that's obviously physicalism. But if I'm going to tell you that well, we're going to explain the physical world in terms of consciousness, that's obviously idealism. Especially when you have the context of what I said before about how panpsychism is not inherently monistic or anything like that. Panpsychism is just saying whatever mind is, it's, it's ubiquitous. It doesn't explain the physical world. That's not what panpsychism does. Even fellow panpsychists say that. So this project that he has in mind of explaining the physical world in terms of consciousness, really what he wants, he's an idealist. He's trying to embark on this idealist quest and he's just calling it panpsychism. So let's continue. Let's let him finish this thought here. Already worked out how to do this. We know it can be done. And this is where we go back to the very important work from the 1920s by Bertrand Russell, 
I think we should think of Russell as the Darwin of consciousness. I think he sort of solved all the mysteries. This got okay, yeah. So he thinks Bertrand Russell is the one who solved these mysteries regarding consciousness and how we can explain the physical world in terms of consciousness. But a point that I've made before in the past, and you can look this up if you go to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. You know, maybe I'll just go there real quick here. Maybe I'll just do that for us here. Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy right here. So I'm going to go ahead and share that screen so you guys can see that. So here we go. If you go to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy's entry on neutral monism, they have a section here. If you go to the objections, there's the mentalism suspicion right here. And let's go ahead and read this real quick here. So the most frequent type of objection to the traditional versions of neutral monism is that they are forms of mentalistic monism, Barclay idealism, panpsychism, or phenomenalism. The core argument is simple. Sensations, pure experience, or in the case of Russell, sensations slash percepts, are paradigms of non-neutral mental entities. Hence, there's nothing neutral about these neutral monisms. The prima facie plausibility of this objection is beyond doubt. And I could not agree more. So if what Russell is talking about, what he's describing is really just a form of idealism. He's saying that these fundamental entities are sensations and percepts. And he's saying, well, Russell solves the problem by saying what's fundamental is just these sensations and percepts, and that's what explains everything. But that's just idealism. So really, it's it's not Russell that solved these great mysteries. It's idealism that solved these great mysteries. And so I think that's what he's ultimately looking for here. It's not panpsychism that's doing this work. And we can make this a bit more clear if we go to this uh, timestamp right here. Let's go right over here. Sense of their position. So the idea that the fundamental level of reality, we have networks of very simple uh, conscious entities interacting in simple, predictable ways. Through their interactions, they realize certain patterns, certain mathematical structures. And then the thought is those mathematical structures just are what we call physics. <laughs> See, like... Think about that. What's fundamental are these sensations slash percepts, if we're being more accurate. It's just these mental entities and their behaviors, their interactions is what physics is. It's just mental entities behaving in certain ways. I don't see how that's not idealism. Even if you want to, call, I'm not saying it's not panpsychism. I want to make that clear. I'm not saying that he isn't a panpsychist because I do believe he wants to say all things have a mind or mind-like quality or something like that. But what he's talking about here in this context, to be more precise, really, he's just talking about, I mean, like, let's, let's think about this in terms of physicalism. If I told you what's fundamentally real are these fundamental uh, physical entities and all that uh, exists from apart from that is just their interactions. It's just physical particles and how they behave. You'd call that physicalism. So I really don't see how saying, well, there's just fundamental mental entities and how they behave, how that isn't just saying that consciousness is exhaustive of reality. There's just mental entities and their behaviors. So, well, that's that point. So I've been picking on uh, Philip enough. Let's go ahead and address some of the stuff that Sean Carroll has to say. So we'll go ahead to this timestamp. Did somebody say oh, wow. he's Get delivered oh, like too a much, bro. These materialists, man, they're killing us with these ads. So there are people out there, as you've just seen, who think that the difficulties we have in understanding consciousness should lead us to dramatically alter our best picture of physical reality. That's not true. 
Even those like George Barkley said that actually idealists are defending common sense. We're not asking you to change your understanding of, quote, physical ready, as you call it. And to make this more clear here, I could be getting ahead of myself, but, and uh, real quick, this guy does bring up a good point. To be fair, Snoop Dogg is the greatest philosopher of our time. Yeah, I guess, you know, I get annoyed by the ads, but he's technically correct about that. But anyway, so to get back to the show, that science, he wants to say, essentially, that it's giving us a better understanding of physical reality, but that's not actually accurate. Science is about empirical studies. It's about studying the empirical world. Science is based on observation, and it's about multiple subjects also having their observations, and we're comparing our observations against each other. And how we verify our results are with observation, experience. So it's not that science or any of this stuff is giving us an understanding of the quote unquote physical world. It's giving us an understanding of the empirical world. And idealism is not offering, is not saying change your understanding of the empirical world. On the contrary, the world is experience or experiential in its nature. So we're saying stick to experience, stick to the empirical. So on the contrary, Sean Carroll, that's not true. And, uh, but I'll, I'm going to go into more detail here when he brings it up again, because I have a lot more to say on that, actually. But that's just going to be kind of a teaser here. And he's going to be I'm trying to talk about emergence here. He's got quite a bit to say here. And this is very typical from a materialist. Let's see what he's got. Mathematically, maybe you discover it empirically. That's fine. The thing is, you're not putting anything new in at the emergent level. You're just saying that's a different way of talking about the same stuff that's going on at the micro level. So a physicalist is going to say the same thing about consciousness. They're going to say there's a very fundamental level where we're all made of quantum fields and there's Hamiltonians and observables and things like that. But we can also step back a little bit and talk about the biological level where there are in our brains neurons and there's chemistry going on. There's connections and signals uh, that go across synapses. That's another perfectly valid way of talking, completely compatible with the underlying quantum field theory description. And then there's a human scale way of talking where there are agents, right? People with free will. They behave in certain ways and they also have consciousness. They have impressions. They... Okay, so I think that could be enough for now. So he's trying to say, and he will also bring this up again, that consciousness is what we call weakly emergent versus strongly emergent. And I'll explain that very briefly. So if we want to say, to give a very easy example, if I have a bunch of Legos, okay, if I have a bunch of Legos and I put them all together and I make a face of those Legos, really, the face is nothing more than just, you know, the amalgamation of these Legos. It's just a combination of Legos just put together. There's nothing more to the face than that. Okay, strong emergence would want to say something a bit more radical. It would say that when you combine the Legos together in the right form, somehow a face will just pop out of the Legos. And there's, it's more than the Legos. It's not reducible to the Legos. It's more than that. So that's a basic understanding of weak emergence versus strong emergence. He wants to say consciousness is weakly emergent. He compares it to just like how you have chemistry uh, emerging weakly from fundamental physical stuff, quote unquote, like fields and wave functions, whatever. Well, he wants to say that's how consciousness works as well. But the problem is it does not appear to be that way. If you look at a bunch of neurons, um, okay, you can see you have one neuron, two neurons, trillions of neurons, whatever. You can combine them as much as you want, but that does not seem to be anything more than that, just a collection of neurons. You just have them, a bunch of chemicals and electrical activity going on, but that's it. We don't see anything more than that. I I've heard somebody compare uh, consciousness to traffic before. And it's like, well, well, traffic is nothing more than just a bunch of cars all kind of close together, kind of in, in on the highway or something like that. There's nothing more to traffic than just a bunch of cars 
smash together. Okay. Consciousness doesn't appear to just be a bunch of neurons just mashed together. There's, there's a first person perspective. There's what it is like to be and stuff like that. So the weekly emergent picture on its face, it just doesn't seem to add up. And if it was, if it were the case that it were weekly emergent, then it wouldn't be such a big problem. There wouldn't be this hard problem. It wouldn't be such a big mystery. Notice how there's no hard problem of digestion or hard problem of photosynthesis or something like that. We know that these are reducible phenomena that we can understand and analyze through all sorts of scientific means. They want to say consciousness is just like that. But at the same time, they admit that they have a hard problem. And uh, he admits this right here. So let's go to 28 to 17 or 14. Oh my goodness, another ad. Sorry, bros. I'm sorry. Wix is your platform to perform on. Brutal. That this basic strategy is on the right track, but let me be very, very quick to admit, I do not know how consciousness works. Whenever I'm up on stages talking about consciousness, number one, it is never my idea. And number two, people always say, why are you up there doing that? You don't know anything about consciousness. So let me reiterate that I don't know anything about consciousness, but I know something about the fundamental nature of reality. So much so that I'm confident that whatever just the explanation of consciousness is going to be, someday it will be within that framework. Okay, yeah. So he may be presenting himself as if he's being humble, as if it's like, well, maybe, well, we just don't know now, but maybe one day we will. But the problem is, I don't see why, if consciousness were just another reducible phenomenon, just like everything else, just like the Lego face, just like digestion and photosynthesis and all that stuff, then why is consciousness so special? Why is this the phenomenon that's all of a sudden so difficult to analyze? Why, why can I analyze traffic? Why can I analyze the, a, a bunch of neurons together? Why can I analyze all these chemical reactions and biological phenomenon, but then all of a sudden, just for consciousness, magically, there's just this gap. There's just this mystery where we're just like, I just don't know, bro. I just don't know. Why? That's arbitrary. That 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 should be a clue to the physicalist. But instead, they, they kind of just tend to cope and say something like, well, we, we, well, one day we'll get there. But um, we have no reason to trust them on that. We don't really have a good reason to believe that's going to happen. So anyway, here's where I'll get into a little bit more detail about what he has to say about science and about how it has to play into his physicalism. So we're going to go to this timestamp here. We'll just start here. It should be fine. Here on Earth. Whew, no That's ads. Good. But it's better even than that. It's not just that we haven't yet seen anything that is in conflict with the core theory. It's that we know if we do eventually see something in conflict with it, which we're very confident that someday we will, but it has to be cleverly hidden. In other words, we have an understanding of the ways in which the core theory can fail within the broad framework of modern quantum field theory physics. There's a little plot, it's too small for you to read, but the point is we have quantitative limits on the kinds of particles and forces that might not yet be observed and those limits are good enough for us to say they're so weakly interacting with us that they are completely irrelevant for biology, for thinking, for consciousness. Okay, yeah. So what he's not realizing, and a question in the audience gets him on this as well, but um, I'll add to it as well before I get to that, is that what Sean is not realizing is the metaphysical neutrality of science. So like we said before, he sort of just equivocates our understanding of physics with our understanding of the physical world. He's not alone in doing that. A lot of people do. But like I said before, as a reminder, science gives us an understanding of the empirical world, which is not necessarily the same thing as the physical world. If they want to say that's the case, they're free to meet their burden of proof to justify that claim. I have arguments against that, but I don't need to go there. The point is, is that um, he's trying to say the core theory of physics when we're talking about the structure and dynamics, i.e. the behavior of the things that we observe, he's like, well, you know, 
a theory like strong emergence would violate the core theory, our understanding of physics. So that makes us skeptical of it. Okay, but you know, if you if you are happen to cohere with it, well, then there isn't really a problem. But that does cohere with idealism, even dualism, and of course materialism. You could have either of those metaphysical views and still hold to the core theory. So it's not like materialism has this monopoly on the core theory. Like, well, if you're trying to go away from materialism, you must violate the core theory. And it's like, oh, no, actually, you don't need to do that. But then he wants to say, well, if you don't violate the core theory, well, then it's irrelevant. And then, but, but no, like, I, I'm going to address that soon. I'm getting ahead of myself again. So let's see what the questioner in the audience has to say, because I think he gets him on this point. Okay, it's at 149.16. I pray there's no ads. If there is ads, again, what I'm going to do for next time is I'll download it as an MP4, and then there should be no ads when we skip through. Notion has been the centerpiece of my workflow. So, it's quite literally an extension of my brain. You win this round, advertisers, but next time. Uh, quick question for Sean. Um, if there can be multiple interpretations of the formulas of quantum mechanics and the experiments as well, that posit like radically different ontologies, like many worlds or uh, objective chanciness or hidden variables. Why couldn't the same be said for there being multiple interpretations of the core theory? One that posits non-conscious entities at a fundamental level and another that posits conscious entities at the, at the fundamental level, but still both using the core theory. Exactly. And the questioner brings up an excellent point. You can totally have an interpretation of the core theory that is panpsychist in nature or idealist or what have you. And you still have the core theory. You're not, you're not removing it or anything like that. And I'm going to let Sean Carroll respond, but his response is pretty weak in my opinion. Yeah, because in quantum mechanics, Goff approves. calling the different theories interpretations is just an antiquated mistake. Interpretations. Back in the day, in the 1930s, when we didn't understand that much about quantum mechanics, and we said, okay, there's phenomena we observe, we can predict, and we need to interpret how to think about what's going on. And those were the bad old days. And so we debated interpretations. Now we debate honestly different physical theories. And no, he's actually wrong about that. What we uh, talk about, what we debate are different empirical theories, okay? Not physical theories. I know a lot of people talk that way, and they might mean something else by the word physical than what Carol's meaning here. And I'm trying to make it clear that science is about empirical studies. It's about observation, stuff like that. So no, I think he's wrong on that. And we're not talking about interpretations per se. We're talking about metaphysics. We're talking about physicalism, dualism, or idealism, stuff like that. And those weren't the bad old days when we used to do metaphysics. That's still today. You're presenting a metaphysical thesis right now called physicalism. And that's not an interpretation, quote unquote. That's a metaphysical thesis. So we need to make that clear. And so the audience member is actually absolutely right. And Carol's response is irrelevant. And uh, Goff doesn't really have much to say about that. There's this point where he kind of asked for his opinion and Goff doesn't have much to say. But um, this, this is an important point to bring up. I mean, you can't let that one go. So... What we're going to do now is we're going to go to Carol's dilemma. So Sean Carroll has a dilemma for those of us who think consciousness is fundamental. And he wants to particularly challenge Goff or Philip. So let's see what's going on here. They would rather not address it. And the dilemma itself is very simple. Any specific version of panpsychism or anything that says something other than pure physicalism must choose between saying the core theory is not quite right and we have to change it or the core theory is fine. I claim using principles of logic not to be my Aristotle that those are the only two choices. Your theory of panpsychism is either changing the behavior that we know about from particle physics or it's not. Those are the only two choices. If you're ever dating a panpsychist, Ask them this question. It's okay if they choose the first option. It's okay if they choose the second option. The only thing not okay is if they refuse to answer and they equivocate and they change the subject. Red flag. Swipe left. Okay. So maybe we should go back just a little bit here a second ago. 
So yeah, either you're changing it or you're not changing it. Okay. And then he wants to say that if you're not changing it, then it doesn't really matter. Okay. You're not, you're, I can just kind of ignore you. I can just let you go. Okay. And he talks as if physicalism is this default here where he's like, all right, well, I'm a physicalist and I don't hold conscious fundamental. And, um, you know, he just s smuggles it in there that, well, science tells us about physical reality. So as if that's all we know is about physical reality. And if you're not changing the core theory, I can just ignore you because you're not presenting an alternative to our understanding of quote unquote physical reality. But like I said, no, it's about physics is about empirical reality, not physical reality. And um, just because the uh, core theory is not changing, that's not the same thing as, well, then physicalism stands. Because as the audience member said before, you could have any different metaphysical theory that goes with that. So you could be an idealist, still have the core theory. And, the, and it's really the idealist who can say, well, physicalist, if you're not making a difference, if you're not actually saying anything different outside the core theory, then really it's you we can ignore. Because as an idealist, we just stick to experience. That's all we uh, know about, for the most part, just our thoughts and our experiences. And if physicalism is not going beyond the core theory and is not able to change anything within our experiences, then on the contrary, we can say his own argument against him that, well, I can just ignore you, physicalist. You're not actually presenting anything that's useful or different. All I have to do is stick with experience. And idealism st sticks with experience. I don't need to go beyond it. And so actually, <laughs> let's, let's see, let's hear him go into a little bit more detail here. Because he's going to talk about the second horn a bit more. Let's see what else he has to say here. He'll let you know, not changing the core theory. I used one simple webinar presentation uh, to produce two million dollars in the past twelve months, and it was a hundred percent gnarly. I kind of like this option because then I can stop listening. Then I don't really need to have any interaction with that person anymore. Why should I care if you have, you know, this great, great theory, and I say, what does it do to my understanding of the physical world? And you say nothing. Okay. Well, yes. Yeah, see, well, again, we don't have to say anything about physical reality. We have no need for that language at all. We can just say, well, this informs our understanding of empirical reality. And the second he wants to bring up the existence of a physical reality, we go, what are you talking about? Define what you mean by that. Prove it's real and show me how it makes any difference to the core theory. And the second he says, well, it doesn't make a difference to the core theory we can use his own argument against him and say, well, then I don't need to pay attention to you anymore, Sean Carroll. We can use his own thinking against him and say, well, physicalism is useless. You're not changing anything about our understanding of empirical reality. So this totally turns the tables on the physicalist. And this is what idealists can do that dualistic types can't do because we're able to put the burden of proof rightfully back on them. A lot of the times we just... Uh, not we as an idealist, but non-physicalist types just give the physicalist so much ground and then we politely ask for some of it back. You know, that's not the way to do it. You have to challenge them on everything. You, you don't give them anything for free. If he talks about a physical reality, you go, what are you talking about? What's that? Prove it's real. How does it make a difference with the core theory? You know, and it, remind them of this rhetoric that, well, science is not about physical reality. It's about empirical reality. So let's see Philip's reaction to this and specifically to the, to the second horn. We're going to just go to that one here. So 54, 15, we're close enough. Please no ads. Um, now Sean just, I mean, at the end of the day, he just comes back to this. Well, if physics is going to stay the same, I don't care if it's not, you know, and I just think that is revealing, um, that is revealing a sort of scientific commitment that all we care about is experiments. If it's not making a difference to experiments, we don't care about it. But my, my fundamental starting point is there is another data point here. Experiments are absolutely crucial, but there's something else we know about re reality. Yeah, see, and see, this is that dualistic language that I think helps physicalists get away with it. Okay, I think this is not a strong response from Philip. So because by, 
by giving them this ground that, well, yeah, we know about physical reality, but then there's also this extra other stuff. The physicalist is going to hear that and take that as a cue to be like, mm, they're just going to dig their heels in. They're going to turn the skepticism dial up and go, well, I don't really think I need to believe in this extra other stuff. Oh, I just need physical reality. And if I don't understand it right now, in terms of physical reality, one day we will. You see, you're giving them that wiggle room. And that's where they, 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 they do those, those rhetorical moves. But the idealist is able to turn the tables on them entirely. A response like mine doesn't give them any wiggle room at all. We don't say, well, yeah, there's physical stuff, but then there's also, in addition, other stuff. I say, no, there's only mental stuff. There's only consciousness. There's only experiences, ideas, thoughts. And then the second he wants to claim there's more than that, you push them on the burden of proof there and say, prove it. Show me. Show me this physical stuff. All I have are experiences of the world. I can touch. I can smell. I can see. I have all that going on. Why should I think there's anything more than experience? And do you see how you put the burden of proof on them? The burden of proof isn't on you anymore at that point, because we all know there's experiences. We know there's thoughts and ideas. To, to deny that is self-defeating. So this completely pulls the rug out from underneath the physicalist. It's a much stronger stance rhetorically. It's the high ground. They have to come to you and defend their position as they rightfully should. You don't just give it to them for free because they never give any of it back. So, oh yeah. And this is some other funny stuff that's coming up here. So this was very interesting. It gets a little heated. I wouldn't say heated maybe, but like, you know, they get, they get a little, you know. Oh, bros. Here, we can just mute that. How about that? Okay. I am. But I, I did feel weird to hear Philip say that he thought that I got up here and said, physicalism just must be true because it's true and that's what scientific methods tell us is true. I don't think that I said that. I tried to provide arguments for why it is the best way forward, the most promising way forward. Let's be honest. So I know it's Ooh. a debate. But... <laughs> yeah. So he's like kind of like uh, subtly implying that, well, hey, let's be honest here. You know, like, like all right, like, you know, like uh, implying maybe Philip is not being honest. Um, I'm not sure if Philip necessarily characterized his position the way he just characterized it right there. But I mean, when I think it's not that far off i'm not saying that is his position but it's really not that far off he kind of has this position of like well science just gives us the, the best understanding of physical reality and there's no need to go beyond that so you know science tells us this and that's that i mean that kind of somewhat is a little bit like i'm i'm reducing it a bit right there obviously but like i mean there's a clip i'll play um in a little bit which we'll we'll see here which does kind of affirm that a bit but yeah, I think uh, he's kind of like suggesting maybe Philip was being a little dishonest there. And then let's see what else is going on. Oh, yeah. He gets a little upset here. That's something. Understand why I think it's the best way to bet. So just to go through some points very quickly, let's go to the fundamental dilemma that I said. Is your version of panpsychism going to change the fundamental physics as we know it, the core theory, or is it not going to change? I think, correct. so correct me if I'm wrong. Did you give us an answer? <laughs> I'll take that as a no. <laughs> he kind of wiggled a little bit, kind of like, you know, so, oh, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. I, I think that's not okay, personally. I'm, I'm Being a panpsychist is perfectly okay, but to be a principal panpsychist, you got to tell me whether your version of panpsychism changes physics as we know it or doesn't. <laughs> yeah, and he kind of he kind of big dogged him there a little bit there. He's just like, yeah, well, does it or not? And God was like, uh, I, I don't know. And, you know, he's like, well, and then you know, Carol just kind of it's like, well, you know, uh, I could. They're doing that thing. I don't know if you know this, but um, they're making it so if you have an ad blocker, they make it so you can't watch the video. So. I don't know. What I'm going to do next time is I'm just going to like download it as an MP4 and there's not going to be any ads and no worries about it. So that'll be the solution there. But anyway, so 
like Goff, Philip has this answer that, well, it depends on your version of panpsychism if it violates it or not. And that's correct, technically, but Carol rightfully wants to know, well, what about your version of panpsychism? Does your version of panpsychism, you know, violate the core theory or something like that? Well, I mean, does it? I mean, I don't know. He didn't really say. He just kind of tells you, well, it depends on your version. But we really need to know about your version, Philip. Does your version violate the core theory? And I can't recall actually what his answer was. He may have answered it, but I can't actually can't remember if he did. But um, anyway, so something else I will bring up too, again, which ties into something else that I've said. Let's see here. What he believes. And I do think that we should be open to the possibility that oh, this yeah. is fundamental and so forth. I don't think that we know. I'm trying to judge credences and balance them against each other. When it comes to future knowledge about science, about psychology, about philosophy or whatever, we judge things, right? We don't know what the right answer is. We have feelings that this is more promising, this is less promising and so forth. In my mind, sticking with our incredibly successful picture of the physical world as central and fundamental is by far the best way to bet about future progress. But yeah, so do you see how he kind of sneaks that in there? He kind of smuggles in that physicalism. So it's like, okay, look, he, he kind of starts off at this humble, he kind of lures you in with that, like, well, you know, we're just, yeah, we don't know. It could be true. Maybe so. I don't know. But... You know, physics gives us our, well, all we know, right, we just have our best understanding of physical reality through physics. And until something changes that, there's no need to change our view of the physical reality. But like I've said before, he's just smuggling physicalism in there. All physics only informs us about empirical reality. And the idealist can say, well, it just tells us about experiences. We have no need for any talk of a physical world or any of that stuff. And even if we do talk about a physical world, we can reduce it to experience or something mental. So that's something that you need to keep in mind when you're talking with physicalists, because this is what they do a lot of times. I'm not trying to associate, you know, accuse them of any malice or any wrongdoing or being dishonest, but that's how the rhetoric works. There's these rhetorical traps that a lot of non-physicalists fall into. Like um, a big part of this debate was actually the the knowledge argument with Mary, you know, Mary, this, the color scientist and all that stuff. And I didn't really address it. Um, and I'm not going to address it at all here. And I don't think it's, I'm not too attracted to that argument. As someone who is a non-physicalist, I'm not a big fan of that argument. And I think a big part of it is because it gives too much ground to the physicalist and it makes it too dualistic when you look at it. It's like, oh, you, you just assume like, okay, well, there are these qualitative facts. You just, you, you grant them that. You grant them these non-mental, non-experiential facts for free. You go, okay, well, there's these qualitative facts, you know, that Mary can study. But in addition to that, you add this new stuff and say, but she also learns something new when she has these experiences. And that's the non-physical facts. And you see, you're you're giving away too much to the physicalist with that. You're, 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 because they're, they're just going to dig their heels in and say, well, you already gave me the qualitative facts. I'm just going to stick to the qualitative facts, the non mental facts. I don't need this additional, just one day I'll do it, which is a cope, as we all know, but they're, that's what they're going to do. So the idealist instead, don't do that. Okay. What you instead do, it's all qualitative facts, it's all mental facts, it's all experiential. Everything that you know, is a matter of experience. It's all empirical. So that's, I think, the best way to approach the physicalist. You just you don't even need to have an argument against them. You just knock the foundation that they're standing on. You just pull the rug out from underneath them, and their rhetoric falls apart. And so, yeah, I, Philip did not call that out, but it's because he hasn't he hasn't embraced who he is as an idealist yet. When he's an idealist, he can embrace this rhetoric that I'm talking about, and you just totally refute the physicalist here. 
Okay, so Carol, yeah, let's see what he says here. Of a, ta of a tapestry that is pulled together. And to say that, okay, I'm gonna posit that consciousness is fundamental improves my understanding of that not at all. I don't see how I have any better understanding of what I am experiencing when I see red just by saying, well, redness, the experience of conscious redness is fundamental. Okay, so like I've touched on a little bit before, what, what, well, real quick, what he's saying here is he, he's not seeing what we get out of positing consciousness is fundamental. And based on points I've said before, what we get out of consciousness being fundamental is the reality of consciousness. Because emergence fails, as I said before. If you want strong emergence, that's going to violate the core theory, which you're not a fan of and none of us are really a big fan of. But if you want weak emergence, that's not going to work because consciousness is not reducible, as I said before. So if both weak emergence and strong emergence fail, then emergence fails. Which means if consciousness is going to be real, then it can't be emergent. Which means it's fundamental. So that's what you get out of fundamental consciousness. You get to keep the reality of consciousness, which you know is real. It's the one thing that you know for certain to be real. Let me make this a little bit more clear here as well. Think about it like this, okay? Let's assume maybe that you are in the matrix or something like that. Okay, we all know this famous thought experiment where Descartes knows, well, I think the four I am, even if the world I'm seeing is an illusion, I know for sure I'm still real right? We already know that. But think of this as well. If you're in the matrix and you're doing physics in the matrix and you're finding out the mechanics of this world that you're seeing and all that stuff, but then you get unplugged from the matrix and the quote unquote real world has physics that's nothing at all like the physics that you were observing in the matrix. Well, then what does that tell you? That means even though you were doing physics earlier, you were genuinely doing real physics while in the matrix, but at no point were you actually studying the real world. So what does that tell you? Physics isn't necessarily a study of the quote unquote real world. It's just a study of what we're observing. It's our experiences and how they relate to what we can quantify and predict. It's really just, it's looking at our experiences and saying, what will we experience next? And let's predict what we're going to experience next. And that's really the business of science. So again, we don't, th this is a thought experiment to make clear that physics isn't necessarily about describing what's the real world, the quote unquote physical reality. It's just about experiences. As an idealist, I think, yeah, experience is reality, but there's other issues I can bring up about science that, you know, I have more of an instrumentalist approach, but even if you don't, that point still applies with that thought experiment. And so, yeah, just to make it more clear again, the point of keeping consciousness as fundamental is you want to make sure consciousness is real. Emergent ones fail. Okay, so let's see some other thoughts he has to say here. Let's go to there individual parts of a theory that you can't specifically see. I've written whole books about the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, where I think that every time a, an atom uh, nucleus decays, a whole new universe is created that we will never see. I'm 100% comfortable with things that we can never see or experience being part of a scientific theory. Why? Because they play an explanatory role. I cannot, and, and this is an honest effort on my part. I cannot see the explanatory advantage. I see the warm and fuzzy feeling that if you say, well, consciousness <laughs> is fo foremost, it's fundamental. That's why I experience the redness of red. So as we said before, obviously we don't hold conscious as fundamental because, uh, oh, it gives us a nice warm and fuzzy feeling. No, it's because it's to account for the reality of consciousness, which your physicalist ontology fails to do. And so what's going on here is the explanatory power of consciousness comes in a very obvious case of what we just call simple mental causation. Just 
humans behaving based on their feelings and their thoughts. If you want to go to the fridge because you're thirsty, I feel thirsty. I'm having the feeling of thirst. I want to get a drink of water or I want to go out for some entertainment. I feel like having the experiences of having some fun or something like that. We explain those in mental terms. That's what psychology is about. Psychology gives psychological explanations of behavior. So, and mental causation is important. It's crucial. In fact, um, contemporary science and philosophy, this is even said in the Stanford Encyclopedia, that the, it, in general, the field largely agrees that we cannot make sense of behavior without these mental terms. Uh, it's explanatorily impaired to try to explain the behavior of conscious beings without referring to their mental states. So if this purely physicalist ontology is explanatorily impaired, it fails when it comes to explaining human behavior. And you could even say for animals as well. So we need mental causation. And that's the explanatory power of consciousness that we need, that the majority of scientists and philosophers agree is very real and very important. So um, we need to keep consciousness. Well, well, one, we know it's obviously real and obviously it's explanatorily important. So, and also another reason why this is so important is because it avoids the interaction problem as we've talked about before. So even he has to bring this up here. I recommend that as a strategy uh, for trying to improve your grade. This argument goes way back, obviously. Yeah, see, if you notice here, maybe I should go back just a second there. Uh, for trying to improve your grade. Notice how he has this duality, right? If you have consciousness and physical reality, if you, has this, if you have this duality, he brings up this argument goes way back. that you have the interaction problem. How does an immaterial mind interact with the body? But if you're an idealist, you don't see things in terms of an interaction. To interact implies there's two different things and one goes with the other. That's what it means to interact. One thing affecting another. But if you see the body and mind as one and you see reality ultimately as mind, then all causation is mental causation and you explain everything in terms of mind and its behaviors and so on. So there is no interaction problem. See, he's worried about the interaction problem. He knows that, well, if you have a physical world and consciousness as two different things, you're going to have the mind-body problem. And I agree. So if you want to actually keep consciousness as real, again, you have to hold it as fundamental. And if you want it to have explanatory power without an interaction problem, then you have to embrace idealism. You have to hold it as, you have to hold consciousness as exhaustive of reality. Otherwise, interaction problem. And so we're getting close to the end here, folks. Just a couple more timestamps left. So let's go to 113. Let's pray we do not get destroyed by an ad. The physical. I'm still lacking a reason why in that case it matters. An analogy is not good enough to me. If the behavior of all the physical world is exactly the same in those two pictures, I want to know why it matters. Again, like we've already said before, I won't go into detail. It's about empirical reality, not physical reality. In what sense can I claim that one picture explains more than the other if they predict exactly the same actions and behavior in the physical world? Well, like I've already argued before, it doesn't seem like physicalism can account for the reality of consciousness. So that's a big thing to be concerned about. Okay, if you can't account for something that you know for sure is real within your metaphysical framework, that's a big problem. Even if you think you can account for various behaviors, I'm going to say you can't without mental causation. You're going to say that you, you can't explain things in your physicalist framework, but the majority of scientists and philosophers are going to say, no, you're going to need mental causation, which is going to be in mental terms. You can't explain everything in purely these quote unquote physical terms. And like I've already alluded to before, I don't think the word physical even means much. You just explain everything in experiential terms, really. 
And um, yeah, and I don't think he's really even understanding the, the difference of physics and metaphysics here as well. Okay, like even if our ontology makes no difference to physics, like I've like I'm saying here, I don't think I'm trying to change physics right now. Okay. The point is we're trying to give our metaphysical thesis, which that's what materialism is as well. So this isn't about physics. This is about metaphysics. You're giving your metaphysical theory a physicalism. I'm giving mine of idealism. I'm giving reasons why idealism is true. You're not really even giving reasons to believe physicalism is true. You're just talking about physics, which is irrelevant. It's not a good point. It's it, like I've explained in detail. So this doesn't work. So let's go to 156. This is the last one here. And this isn't too gnarly or anything like that. There's not a whole lot to go off of here. It's just him kind of uh, talking about um, some of the implications of physicalism. It's all under the rubric of science. I don't think that various things that are important to human beings can necessarily be reduced to science. I, I think that aesthetic preferences are fundamentally subjective. I think that morals are fundamentally constructed, not objectively out there in the world, not derivable by science. So there's certainly more to the world than science, but in terms of understanding what the world is and how it behaves and how it works, science is, a, is the way to go. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, so um, he talked a bit about, you know, moral and aesthetic anti-realism a bit, and and uh, this isn't anything new, but it just kind of shows you with what he said before about how with weak emergence, you're not getting anything new that wasn't already there. And so if you start with a physicalist ontology, this these purely non-mental things, what have you, if you start with that and you just have weak emergence from there, then yes, all you have are you know, these things that have nothing to do with beauty or goodness, because how are you supposed to get beauty and goodness from non-beauty and goodness? It's really just a subjective idea is what he's getting at about how, yeah, it's just a subjective phenomenon, whatever. It's no different than saying it's imaginary or it's unreal. It's just an idea that people are thinking about. So physicalism naturally leads to anti-realism about goodness, you know, ethical truths, and aesthetic truths, the stuff about beauty. So um, an idealist can account for that easy. We can hold that as fundamental, especially if you're like a theist or something like that. So anyway, it's just another flaw of physicalism. If you believe in something like goodness and beauty is real, Sean Carroll's view isn't going to be able to accommodate for that. So if you think that's those things are, if you're convinced that's definitely real, you should reject his view. So I guess that's all I have for you tonight. It's a pretty chill stream. This is just an hour long just reacting to a debate. Um, I don't know when I'll do one again. I might do one a week from now. And I'm not 100% sure what I'll do the stream about. I'll be thinking about it. But um, yeah, we're just starting here. This is episode one. I might have guests and things like that. So if you want to keep up, just go ahead and subscribe to the channel and have the notification bell so that you're alerted when I'll go live again. Because I make edited videos as well. But I'm going to be streaming a little bit more frequently than I do those edited videos. So Perhaps I'll see you next week. And you can also follow me on Twitter or X, whatever you call it. I post there pretty frequently as well. So, and we also have a Discord server called Idealism Forever, which is open to everybody, but especially idealists of all different kinds. So if you're an idealist and you want to talk with more people like yourself, go ahead and join our Discord server, Idealism Forever. So anyway, thanks again for joining. It's a lot of fun hanging out with you guys. Until next time, peace. Peace.